let me just say good morning, good afternoon. Hello, hi, everybody. And um, wonderful to have Lynn back with us. And Lynn, whenever you are ready, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, well, I'm ready. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Wendy, for that very warm welcome. And thank you, Judy. And thank you, Trudy. And it's lovely to be back here. So the subject of my talk today is the colonial era. And was it a golden age? I'm talking about the colonial era in the Middle East and North Africa and how it affected the Jews. Now, the era I'm talking about really was relatively short. It um, lasted from the end of the 19th century to about 1950. There were protectorates, there were mandates ruled by the French, the British and the Italians. And this era was followed by decolonization and Arab states declared their independence. Now, Egypt was never legally a protectorate. It was ruled by a Khedive, ch but effectively the British pulled the strings so it can be referred to as a veiled protectorate. Iraq was nominally independent from 1932, but the British dominated foreign policy. I will just start sharing my screen. Hope you can see that. Uh, and this uh, picture actually shows an Algerian Jewish family from Constantine. Uh, in the 1930s. And uh, Algeria was uh, actually considered part of metropolitan France after 1830. Just to remind you, the Jews were amongst the um, oldest inhabitants of the Middle East and North Africa outside Palestine. And the region is, of course, at the crossroads of Europe, Africa, and Asia. And until the 17th century, most Jews lived under Islam. So this map is a map of the Ottoman Empire, as it was in the 19th century. But already you can see that it is losing land. It's begun to decline. Um, and the early 19th century marked a, a low point in the fortunes of Jews in the Ottoman Empire. So what was the status of Jews? Well, they were dhimmis, which meant that they were allowed to practice their religion along with Christians. Um, they were protected people but they were also inferior and they were continuously reminded of the fact that they had converted to the ultimate revelation of Islam uh, by being subject to a set of restrictions and uh, limitations. Under the dhimmi status, you don't have rights as such. You bought your protection with hard cash by paying a tax. Uh, a foreign visitor to Morocco called Reverend Brooks wrote this in 1841. He said, in Morocco, they are equally ground down, referring to the Jews, they are ground down by a barbarous despotism. The Moors consider that the object of a Jew's birth is to serve Muslim and he is consequently subject to the most wanton insults the boys for their pastime beat and torment the Jewish children. The men kick and buffet the adults. They walk into their houses at all hours and take the grossest freedoms with their wives and daughters. The Jews invariably coming off with a sound beating if they venture to resist. The dhimmi status wasn't always uniformly applied. Some uh, periods in history, the Jews um, were actually quite prosperous and thrived. Other At other times, they didn't. It really depended on the rule of the day and how strictly they applied uh, Sharia law. 
Uh, but the 19th century was also a time of uh, commercial expansion. And um, creeping westernization um, made its mark. And here you see David Sassoon, who's sitting in the middle there with three of his eight sons. And uh, the Sassoons actually founded a, 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 an amazing business empire. They left their native Baghdad and they set up this empire in the wake of the British Empire. And, and this business network spanned India, Burma, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and China. And you can see how westernization had affected their family. You've got two sons dressed in traditional garb. And of course, David is soon wearing his turban in the middle, but you've got one son who's already west, uh, wearing a Western suit. He's not the butler. He's just um, a bit more Western than the others. So the Sassoons were not the only Jews to leave uh, their um, countries of birth. Uh, there were Jews who, Syrian Jews who left for Manchester and uh, Brooklyn. There were Turkish Jews who left for South America, Yemenites for Ethiopia, Aden and India, and Moroccan Jews for South America. And the reasons why these people left was, was, were manifold. It was to escape persecution. Uh, it was to escape conscription. It was to escape the dimmi rules or simply to seek economic opportunities. Already the European powers had wrung one concession from the Ottoman Empire, and that was the capitulations. The capitulations were a means of escaping the dimmi rules, uh, because according to, uh, to this system, uh, Jews could be exempt from local prosecution, local taxation, local conscription, and the searching of their home. And a minority of Jews acquired European passports without ever having visited the country concerned or even spoken the language. At first, European powers intervened to protect minority rights, mainly the Christian minority. In North Africa, Western powers were fighting to gain footholds along the coast and Moroccan ports came under Spanish control. The British and the French vied for influence in Mogador, the largest port in Morocco, that's present day Essaouira. And here Jews could become protégés of foreign governments. And the British in particular had great influence. And one visitor asked whether Mogador was ruled by the Sultan or by Queen Victoria. The answer came back, both. And here you see uh, the merchant elite with their top hats and they strutted around uh, wearing Manchester suits and pretending to be English gentlemen. But the 19th century was also a time when European anti-Semitism began to penetrate the Middle East and it was spread by local Christians. There were two affairs that actually shocked European Jews. Uh, excuse me, sorry, my notes have just fallen down. Um, one was the Damascus affair of uh, 1840. And this, this was a blood libel. A priest called Father Tommaso disappeared. And uh, the anti-Semitic French consul in Damascus alleged that he'd been killed so that Jews could use his blood to make matzah. Jewish notables were rounded up, arrested and tortured. And 63 children held so they would confess where Tommaso's blood was stored. News reached Sir Moses Montefiore in England and Adolphe Crémieux, who was a prominent lawyer in France. They set off together to demand the release of the prisoners. They then journeyed to see the Sultan, the Ottoman Sultan in Constantinople to demand that 
he declare blood libels untrue and prohibit trials on the basis of such accusations. There was another affair that galvanized uh, European Jews, and that was the Mortara affair. And this happened in Italy. And um, it concerned a six-year-old boy, Edgardo Mortara, who was born to a Jewish family in Bologna. He was dangerously ill and his nanny baptized him thinking that uh, he was about to die, uh, but he recovered. Uh, but despite the pleas of his parents, the Pope sent his guards to take a, a, a Edgardo away and bring him up as a Catholic. And actually, this is what happened. Uh, Edgardo Mortaro eventually became a priest and he never returned to his family. So these two events, the Damascus affair and the Mortara affair, had quite an impact on a particular group of French Jews um, who decided to do something about this. And um, 17 middle-class French Jews, mostly from Alsace, but some also from Sephardi background got together and they set up a network, uh, sorry, a, they founded an institution called the Alliance Israelite Universelle. Uh, now these people were imbued with the values of the French Revolution. They were educated in universities founded by Napoleon. They put their faith in science to regenerate society. And three years after the Alliance Israelite Universelle, also known as the AIU, was founded in 1860, Adolphe Crémieux, who accompanied uh, Sir Moses Montefiore on his journey to Damascus, Adolphe Crémieux became the president of the Alliance. Now, the Alliance uh, had an, an amazing effect because these 17 French Jews, what they wanted to do was bring a Western education to uh, Jewish communities that up until then had only had a religious education. And therefore, um, what these French Jews wanted to do was equip um, their um, more less fortunate brethren, especially in Muslim lands, but not exclusively, with the knowledge, with the skills to, um, to survive and even thrive in the modern era. Um, so the Alliance's aims were to protect less fortunate Jews, uh, to act as a lobby group, to fight abuses, help bring about emancipation through education, so that they could fight for their rights. Um, and by 1914, 45,000 children, Jewish children, had been educated in some 200 schools. And by 1960, it had educated almost half a million Jewish uh, children. And it was very important because it actually educated Jewish girls for the first time. So the key to uh, emancipation was really through, uh, through the mother, the mother who would bring up her children um, uh, and they would be raised to be upright, emancipated citizens who'd be able to uh, fight uh, for their rights and do well in society and integrate in society. So education mainly followed the French curriculum, and there would be maths and science. Religion would also be taught, but um, to Jews in Muslim states, um, it was important for, the, for it not to be based on superstition. Um, it would be more of a Maimonidean approach, a rationalist approach. Later on, Hebrew was introduced. Um, I remember, well, my grandparents were educated in the Alliance in Baghdad. And my grandfather learned Turkish because it was still under the Ottoman Empire, French, English and Arabic and Hebrew. Um, 
And here you see the Tunis Girls School um, with the girls still wearing their traditional dress there. And the Isfahan Boys School in Persia, as it was then. Um, so the Ottoman Empire, as I explained, was really the sick man of Europe. And it had no alternative but to concede to European pressure to give equal rights to the Christian and Jewish minorities. So in 1856, the Dimi rules were actually abrogated. Now, uh, this man here, Yakub Sanua, had a huge impact on Egypt. He, he actually founded uh, the National Theatre in Egypt, and he was the author of dozens of plays. Egypt was a veiled protectorate, uh, and even though the British occupation did, had no legal basis, it const uh, Egypt did constitute a de facto protectorate. Uh, sorry, Britain was the, um, it was a British protectorate. Uh, after the Suez Canal opened in 1869, the rule of Egypt, Ali Pasha, invited foreigners, including Egypt, sorry, including Jews, to settle in Egypt and develop the economy. Uh, soon, Jews became very prominent in land and urban development. Um, the wealthy families, Katawi, Suarez, and Moseri, bought thousands of hectares of land for development. Joseph Smuha built a whole city next to Alexandria. Nassim Cohen Saban founded a whole new resort complete with kosher hotels and synagogues called Ras al Bar. 90% uh, of the stockbrokers in, in Egypt were Jews. Um, Jews were heavily involved in the first public transport system in Cairo and the first national rail network. There were three Jewish bankers, Katawi, Suarez, and Dimanash, who uh, received the contract to build the Cairo Helwan Railway. The Moseris administered it, and the trains did not run on Shabbat. Uh, Katawi founded the National Bank of Egypt. Uh, a Jew ran the largest sugar company, the Egyptian petrol company, the salt and soda company, cigarette factories, chocolate candles, copper works. Uh, and on and on. And of course, they were very important in the cotton business because cotton was the mainstay of Egypt. Um, they were involved in plantations, marketing, processing, and a member of the Katawi family created the longest cotton thread in the world. And um, Amazingly enough, Jews did dominate the retail trade or the department stores, uh, Sikurel, Gatenio, Ades, Shemla, uh, Benzion, and Oroz Dibak. And you see um, the Cairo branch of Oroz Dibak here um, on the right. They had branches in Syria and I Iraq and, and Tunis. And uh, Rosdi Bak was actually founded by um, a family of Hungarian Jews. On the left, you see Salvatore Sicurel and his department store, the Sicurel department store. Now, Salvatore Sicurel is an interesting character. He was the leader of the Cairo Jewish community in, in the first half of the 20th century. Educated in Switzerland, he became Egyptian national epe fencing champion in 1928 and captain Egypt's fencing team at the Amsterdam Olympics. Besides which there were dozens of Jewish sporting champions usually trained at the local Maccabee sports clubs. And they ranged from tennis to swimming to table tennis um, to all sorts of things to boxing, very big in boxing. Uh, Sicurel, became a store owner in Cairo and he operated the Sicurel department store. And um, he was very well, well in with the royal family 
and that meant he was spared, his, his department store was not nationalized like the other ones in 1948, and he actually survived um, until the 1956 Suez crisis when the store was put under government control, and thereafter he emigrated to France. Now, uh, the 1920s were an era when Jews actually entered politics. And here you see two finance ministers. Sir so Sasson Heskel uh, was active in Iraq and Joseph Aslan Katawi in Egypt. And Sir so Sasson Heskel is uh, best known for having tied uh, Iraq's oil revenues to the gold standard, which was actually a stroke of genius. And Joseph Aslan Katawi was, was also extremely important and um, prominent. Now, this was also an era of, of great cultural flourishing. Uh, Jewish culture blossomed. Um, and um, amazingly enough, I think, Tunisia was a great center uh, of, of in, in the publishing world. And, and here you see a, um, uh, a book that was produced in Judeo-Arabic. And there, apparently there were 150 authors in Tunisia who wrote and published in Judeo-Arabic. And of course, uh, this gradually gave way to more and more works being published in French as, as French became the lingua franca. But Judeo-Arabic was used to begin with to introduce the Jewish readership to uh, the great classics of European literature, for instance, Robinson Crusoe, The, the Count of Mon Monte Cristo, uh, etc. And I mentioned Jakub Sanwa, the uh, great playwright, satirist, and poet who founded the modern Egyptian theater. So this era is one which Jews look back on with nostalgia. They had servants, nice houses, they joined sporting clubs, they mingled with the local aristocracy, women played bridge, uh, made shopping trips to Paris, and this is my grandmother actually, uh, on her return from one such trip. Families holidayed in Europe. There was a cosmopolitan atmosphere, uh, but you can imagine it might have created some resentment and even envy amongst uh, the Arabs who, who were sort of lagging behind in, in education by at least a generation. So um, there was a man called Amin al mumweyes who wrote a book in 1930 called Baghdad as I Know It. And he gives a fascinating insight through the eyes of a Muslim into how Iraqi Jews were at the forefront of modernizing the country. And I'll read you a short passage from his book. The Iraqi Jews ate the most expensive and rare of fruits and vegetables. As soon as the fruit is available in the market, the Iraqi Jew would buy it, no matter how expensive. The majority of the Jews wear the best quality clothes. The Jewish man will frequent the best snack bars and cafes in Baghdad. They own the best clubs in Baghdad. These are exclusively Jewish and no one else is allowed to join. They also have the schools with the highest standards, both primary and secondary. Um, and um, if, for example, an Iraqi Jew needs to defend himself in court, he can bring in the best lawyers from abroad. The Jews use the most luxurious and pedigree milking cows handle the rarest of domestic birds, the parrots, canaries, and lovebirds. They were the first to import American cars into Iraq. For example, the Ford agents were Ibrahim and Shafiq Addis. Shafiq Addis sadly came to a very tragic end. He was executed in 1948 for being a Zionist, which he was not. Um, and this author, uh, Amin al-Muwayez said, 
they will put up, the Iraqi Jews will put up their summer tents on the riverside, only in the best locations. The Jewish rabbi was the most skilled in circumcision and many Muslim families resorted to using his skills to circumcise their boys. For foreign languages, the best teachers, were Jewish, for example, Shumayel for French and Heskel Effendi for the English language, the best swimming instructors were Jewish. The majority of the merchants who imported the hygienic artifacts and instruments from abroad were Jewish. Uh, Salem Shamoon introduced the bathtub and the boiler to bathrooms. The Shasha family imported the variety of cloths in the Safafia warehouse. The Hakak family imported the Singer sewing machines, the gramophones, ladies' voice, and pithophone records. Just to go back to a moment to the impact of the Alliance Israelite Universelle on uh, Jews in the Arab world, um, I think one should pay tribute to the superb education uh, that Jews did get. And here are a few examples of, of Jews who, who actually um, excelled because of the education they received at the Alliance. And uh, this gentleman, Nisim Dawood, his, his widow may well be listening. I hope she is. Um, he is revered for his masterful translation of the Quran into English for Penguin Classics. He was born in Baghdad, went to the Alliance there and emigrated to uh, London. The Quran which he translated was never out of print since 1956. In fact, it went through 70 reprints. Of course, if you're a translator, uh, people say you should never translate into a, um, a language that isn't your mother tongue. So you can imagine what an achievement it was for uh, Nisim Dawood, uh, born in Baghdad, whose mother tongue presumably was, was Arabic. Uh, there's a, another great um, alumnus of the Alliance, and that's Naim Katan, who would be known to Canadian listeners, perhaps. He only died three weeks ago, and he wrote in French, which again is a, is a magnificent achievement when you're born in Baghdad, uh, but he was able to go to the Sorbonne. He ended up living in Canada for most of his life, and he wrote more than 30 books, all in French. Uh, in Iran, which also benefited from the Alliance, although the, the Alliance didn't come to Iran until uh, 1898, um, we have Solomon Hayim, who produced the first Farsi English dictionary. And, uh, and this dictionary is still in use today, although Obviously, the name Solomon Hayim has been removed and royalties due to him have been stolen by the Islamic regime. But perhaps the greatest alumnus of all of the Alliance is Albert Memi, uh, who died last year, age 99. And he, he was born in a very poor family in the Tunisian Hara, or Jewish quarter in Tunis. And he is well known in France as a writer and philosophy, philosopher. And he wrote about colonization, decolonization, Zionism. Um, and of course he wrote in French. Now, uh, moving on from the Alliance, this gentleman here was born in Baghdad, Naji Dabi. And he'd always wanted to be a pilot. He came within a whisker of becoming head of Iraq's Air Force in 1930, in the 1930s. And while living in Iraq, he became a very close friend of King Razi, who was the son of King Faisal and his personal pilot. The Iraqi Minister of Interior only flew in a plane if Naji was the pilot. So he was offered the top job. <laughs> He turned it down and it was just as well as Iraq came under increasing Nazi influence in the 1930s and the Iraqi army and defense ministry became very anti-Semitic 
Um, and if he had stayed on in Iraq, he probably would have had to fight the British on the side of the Nazis. So it's just as well he left for England just before King Hazi was killed in a car accident. And when World War II broke out, he found himself in England. He volunteered to join the RAF. Uh, he was an instructor and he trained young, young pilots. And then he went on at least two bombing raids uh, in Germany. Quite a remarkable fellow. This guy too was extremely remarkable. He was a pioneer of film in Tunisia. His nickname was Chickley, and he was a man of insatiable curiosity. He introduced the bicycle, the wireless telegraph, and the first X-ray machine to be installed in a Tunisian hospital. A keen photographer, he was instantly attracted to moving pictures. He made 11 films, and this was his daughter, Hede Samama, who was uh, the first actress to appear in a Tunisian film and the first screenwriter. And Jews really were great, uh, were the vector of modernization and they brought entertainment from Europe into the Arab world. And uh, Jews owned cinemas all over the Arab world. They owned the first cinema in Tunisia um, this one here, the Royal Cinema in Baghdad, and many other cinemas, the Al Zahra Cinema, the Odeon Cinema in Tripoli in Libya. Now, this man here is not well known in Egypt. Uh, in fact, his name is sort of has been completely erased from the history books, but everybody knows the Cairo Tower, which he built. So Naum Shebi was a Jew, the architect of the Cairo Tower, which is one of the great landmarks of Cairo. And he also designed other landmarks in the city. We now come to Leila Murad, who was the megastar of, uh, in Egypt. Now, Egypt was the, the Hollywood of the Middle East. Uh, Leila Murad was a great singer and actress. Uh, she was not the only one. There were at least four other famous Jewish actresses. There were Jewish film directors. Uh, there were um, all sorts of people involved behind the scenes who were Jewish. Now, uh, Leila Murad was trained by her father, um, Dawood Hosni, who was also Jewish. She um, made her singing debut at the age of nine. She ended up making uh, 20 films, uh, at, but her father, very interesting, was actually a Hazan or Cantor. Um, and I found this very rare recording of her singing uh, El Nora Halila, which uh, if you ever attend a service in a Sephardi synagogue on Yom Kippur, you will hear this psalm introducing uh, the Ne'ila or the concluding service on Yom Kippur. <laughs> Right, um, just to um, give you the lowdown, she was a great rival uh, of uh, Umm Kulthum, who was also uh, the great diva uh, in, in, um, in the Egyptian uh, singing states. But in 1953, she was selected over Umm Kulthum as the official singer of the Egyptian revolution. Um, but then she was dogged by various rumors that she was an, uh, an Israeli spy, that she visited Israel, 
and donated money to the Israeli army. And her career was more or less finished. She converted to Islam. She married, I think, one of her leading men. Um, and uh, she really retired age 38. But uh, her songs are still played and sung today. Her films are still watched, but most Egyptians don't know she's Jewish. Um, this also happened to the Al Kuwaiti brothers, Daoud and Salah Al Kuwaiti. Um, their, their name comes from the fact that they used to play for the Emir of Kuwait. Um, and they were the Simon and Garfunkel of uh, the Iraqi music scene. Uh, extremely popular. Again, their music is, is still played today. For a long time, their names were erased. Nobody knew who composed their songs. They were just attributed to folklore. Um, and one day it is said that uh, uh, um, the, the Jews were actually very prominent in, in music in, in Iraq. In fact, almost all the musicians in Iraq were Jewish. Um, and um, it is said that the uh, Prime Minister of Iraq switched on the radio one day, uh, and it, it was Yom Kippur that day, and of course the orchestra did not play. Um, and the, he turned to his aides and said, how come I hear silence? There's no music today on the radio. And his aide said, but it's Yom Kippur. And, uh, you know, the Jews don't play on this day. And so he got so angry, he determined to set up an orchestra that would play on Yom Kippur. We cannot really uh, talk about famous Jewish personalities without mentioning Habiba Mesica who I know Patrick Bade has mentioned. Uh, she was a phenomenal singer in Tunisia. Uh, she had a fantastic following. Sadly, she died very young, age 27. Um, everything ended tragically for her. In 1930, shortly before she married a young non-Jewish Frenchman, she was murdered by an older Jewish man who was in love with her and he set fire to her house. Um, but some 5,000 Muslims and Jews attended her funeral. And in the aftermath of her death, her rec record circulated rapidly across uh, North Africa. And the French who were in charge of the protectorate there in Tunisia were so alarmed, they thought uh, it might provoke unrest amongst uh, the Muslims. And so the French authorities decided to ban and confiscate her records. Well, you've heard of synchronized swimming. We may well see some in the Olympics. Um, well, here are the exponents of synchronized dancing par excellence. These sisters, Leila and Lamia, um, were very famous in Egypt in the 1940s. They're actually from an Ashkenazi Jewish family living in Egypt. Their father, Fischl Alpert, was a violinist in the Vienna Symphony Orchestra. Uh, but they became the foremost stars of the Egyptian entertainment world uh, in the 1940s, and they played to packed houses and King Farouk was one of their greatest admirers. Right, so uh, actually you mustn't underestimate the amount of work that went into this synchronized dancing. Uh, they practiced for hours uh, to match the choreography to the musical repertoire. And they moved in wonderful harmony with the dance and the music completely in sync. 
come 1948, um, the colonial era really came to an end. Israel was established. Uh, Arab nation states began to emerge. Uh, there was a great current of anti-colonialism, a current of anti-Zionism. Almost everybody, all the Jews, had to leave, and there were 850,000 Jewish refugees who were driven from Arab countries uh, within a generation and a half, leaving everything behind. Uh, most went to Israel. Uh, many had to endure terrible conditions in the Ma'abarot, in the tent camps. 200,000 went to, El to other places in Europe, the um, America, Canada, Australia, South America. Um, of course, there was a human cost to this uprooting, a great deal of suffering, and for famous stars who'd made their names in the Arab world, it was a particularly shocking experience. For instance, the Al Kuwaiti brothers I mentioned uh, basically lost the market for their music and they ended up running a, a kitchenware shop in the Hatikva market in Tel Aviv. Uh, recently, the Israeli, uh, the sorry, the municipality decided to recognize uh, belatedly their contribution and, and it. Uh, unveiled a street sign in their name. Uh, in Iraq, since the Arab Spring, um, they've also begun to be recognized, um, you know, after really uh, several decades uh, of being, being ignored and their name uh, erased. And the, same, and the same thing happened, sorry, with this lady here, her name is Zohra El Fasia, and she used to sing for the King of Morocco. And she was actually the first female recording artist in Morocco. Uh, she ended up in Israel in uh, 1947. A poet uh, called uh, Erez Bitton, who's, uh, who lives in Israel, composed a particular poem, which I think is studied in, uh, in Israeli schools, and I will just read it very briefly. He was very, he was very moved by uh, Zohra's story. Uh, Zohra El Fasia, a singer at the court of King Mohammed V in Rabat, Morocco. It is said that when she sang, soldiers drew knives to push through the crowds and touch the hem of her dress, kiss her fingertips, express their thanks with a real coin, Zohra El Fasia. These days she can be found in Ashkelon in the poor section of Atikot Sea, near the welfare office, the odor of leftover sardine tins on a wobbly three-legged table splendid kingly rugs stacked on a Jewish agency bed, and she clad in a fading housecoat, lingers for hours before the mirror, wearing cheap makeup. And when she says, Muhammad the fifth apple of our eyes, it takes a moment before you understand. Zohra El Fasia has a husky voice, a pure heart, and eyes awash with love. Zohra El Fasia. So um, I started this lecture um, and I called it with the colonial era, a golden age question mark. And the reason why I put a question mark was really because the, the golden age was, was not as golden as all that, unless you happen to be Zohra El Fasia. Um, because the colonial powers really abandoned the minorities and they began to appease the majority. They stirred up trouble between uh, Jews and Arabs, as we know. Uh, the colonial era did liberate the Jews from the demi-status, 
and bring greater security and rights. But it created resentment from the Muslims who were left far behind. And the Jews appeared to them to be collaborators with the colonials. Um, and also uh, they, they appeared to be rather arrogant and big for their boots. But the Jews did not fill it, fit in with the colonials um, and they weren't entirely accepted. There was a great deal of uh, colonial anti-Semitism um, and they were really between two stools in a kind of limbo of uh, identity. And of course, the colonial era ultimately did betray uh, the Jews of the Arab world. Um, this shows you uh, Marshal Pétain, who uh, was the head of the Vichy regime during World War II, uh, meeting Hitler. And of course, the Vichy regime started stripping the Jews of their rights in preparation for the final solution, effectively, uh, when they ruled uh, North Africa during World War II. So this left the Jews who'd suffered during World War II with a great deal of, of disillusionment. Um, they were disillusioned with, with the colonials and thereafter they turned towards Zionism or communism. And of course, this was the great age of Arab nationalism. The Jews didn't fit in with the Arabs either. The Arabs gradually excluded them uh, from uh, public space and ushered them towards the exit um, and eventually expelled them as well. Today, the Arabs lament the departure of the Jews, uh, the departure of, of the Jews who contributed so much to their societies during the colonial era. But I ask myself, would all these Jews you see here have become successful if they hadn't left? And here you see Gabi Aguillon from Egypt, who started the fashion brand Chloe, Albert Elbaz from Morocco, who was a fashion icon, recently died of coronavirus, unfortunately. Um, uh, Bernard-Henri Lévy, the great philosopher and public intellectual, originally from Algeria. Sir Ronald Cohen from Egypt, who left as a, a refugee with 20 pounds in his pocket in his pocket and became a great entrepreneur and businessman. Charles and Maurice Saatchi, the advertising gurus originally from Iraq. Yuval Noah Harari, the author of the worldwide bestseller Sapiens. His family are from Lebanon. Andre Azoulay, uh, sorry, Audrey Azoulay, originally from Morocco, who's now the director general of UNESCO. So with that thought, I will stop there and very happy to answer questions. Thank you for listening. And I do apologize for that um, interruption we had. Thank you very much. So starting with um, Andrea, she says, a descendant of David Sassoon was a member of the Israeli Knesset after the creation of Israel. I didn't know that. Wonderful. And another little snippet about the Sassoons, Grace and David Sassoon from Shanghai, lived in Tokyo in the 70s, an outstanding cook. Grace gave some recipes to his wife. That's Robert uh, Daniel Vox. Is um, told me this. So yes, the Sassoons spread all over the world, really. There are branches, um, you know, I mean, you find them everywhere. Not all of them remain Jewish, unfortunately. Um, Barbara Schwartz, a comment, not a question. I love your slow, clear way of speaking. Thank you. <laughs> That's uh, very kind. Um, Carol Naim, when I was growing up in Cape Town, one of the sons of the Smuha family came to Rondebosch with his family. He was sent away as he had married for love and oh, not for family and not family ties. Okay. Uh, the 
my cousin in Canada, uh, Toby and Ted, just to remind you that my uncle and your great uncle, Joseph Dawood, was a doctor and he imported the first x-ray machine to Baghdad from Paris where he studied medicine. Oh, that's lovely. I didn't know that actually, Toby. Uh, another famous Jewish family from Baghdad was the Kaduri family uh, who also moved on to China and India. I hope you will be hearing more about the Kaduris and, and the great moguls of, uh, from Baghdad who uh, did so much in China and India later on in the Lockdown University program. I think um, Trudy is, is organizing some lectures there. Uh, what tradition or, of uniform was worn by the young girls in the Tunis school photograph? Oh, thank you very much, Gerald. Um, for saying it's fascinating. Yes, well, the Tunisian Jewish girls or women actually wore this, this peculiar headdress and even um, well into the 20th century. So it wasn't their uniform. I think it was their just traditional dress. Um, yes, so Pat has actually supplied an answer. This is how Jewish women used to dress before the arrival of the Europeans in Tunisia. Men and women were not allowed to be dressed the same way as Muslims did, so women and girls had to wear a pointy hat and men and boys had to wear a sheshia hat of a different color from the Muslims in Tunisia. Jews had to get dressed differently so that they could be recognized. Thank you very much for that, Pat. Um, so Sheila Chiat, so El Nora Lila is part of reform, Yom Kippur liturgy, and sung to the same tune. I didn't know that. Thank you for that, Sheila. Um, Yoram Gaon and Moshe Ben Basat sing El Nora Lila beautifully. Yes, there are many different versions of El Nora Lila. Uh, thank you, Karen, for saying this is so fascinating, a world most of us in the US reformed Jew speaking here know nothing about. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Betty Lowenstein, what happened to the Jamal sisters after Farouk was overthrown? They went to America, Betty, and I think they changed their names. Um, Karen and Harvey, thank you for mentioning the last Kings of Shanghai in your last lecture. I bought it, fascinating story. Uh, you showed a slide, this is Ron, Ron Bick, you showed a slide indicating there were 850,000 Jewish refugees. I would be interested in a lecture or more than one on this issue. Well, Ron, I gave you a sort of lecture on, on this. Uh, my last lecture was an overview um, which ended with the um, displacement of 850,000 Jews. You can find out more if you buy my book, Uprooted, and I did include a reading list um, with, uh, with the notification email that you got about this lecture. So please do um, read up on the question. Monica Goodman, sorry, Goodwin. My father was one of the Murad brothers. Leila Murad is a cousin, isn't that amazing? Fantastic. Ronnie Feldman, more Jews left the Arab world than Arabs Israel. Very true. Very few know this. Very true. There were the largest number of non-Muslims uh, to leave the Arab world up until 2003, when there was a massive exodus of Christians from Iraq. And Yolande says, I bought from my father a beautiful table top book called Les Juifs d'Egypte, which is well worth reading. Lots of books about Egypt. Lots of memoirs written by Egyptian Jews. Uh, you've got um, uh, Andre Asiman, who wrote Out of Egypt. Uh, you've got uh, Lucette Lagnardo, who wrote uh, the, the Man in the White Sharkskin uh, Suit. Lots of very interesting books. Carol Safair, thank you for your compliment. Uh, Betsy Brody. Uh, a Jewish wants a Jewish focus tour of some of these countries with me as, <laughs> as the guide. Well, thank you very much for that, Betsy. Unfortunately, a lot of these countries are actually not welcoming of Jews. You can still go to Tunisia, you can go to Morocco, but I would dare you to uh, try Iraq. <laughs> um, and thank you, Shirley, um, for your lovely comment. Um, ah, June raises an interesting question. 
uh, June Friedman, are you even suggesting can colonization ever be described as golden? Well, nowadays, I think colonization has a very bad image. Uh, but I think um, from the Jewish point of view, uh, there were many good things about uh, colonization. And uh, as I said, it liberated the Jews from the dimni status. And it was certainly preferable with all its faults to what had gone before. Um, so I would say um, colonization was golden in parts, a bit, a bit like a curate's egg, but there were limitations to colonization, obviously, and the colonial powers actually exploited the Jews for what they could get from them. They weren't in a hurry to defend them at times of trouble, and they were very mean when it came to giving them citizenship. Um, so, you know, a mixed, a mixed bag there. Oh, thank you, Victor. Uh, too many Ashkenazim are too ignorant of the history and culture of our Sephardi brothers and sisters. Uh, Danny Wilson. Oh, thank you for the plug for my book. Thank you very much. I think that might be the end of it, Judy. What do you think? Danny, uh, with Danny's question. Um, Oh, no, Thanks, there, is, there is a bit more. Sorry, I'm just mastering my newly acquired skill of scrolling <laughs> up and down the Q&A. Um, thank you, Joan uh, and Tess. And Carol Naim had a very interesting book about a nurse who went with a professor from Germany to work in the Jewish hospital in Alexandria. Yes, I know which book you mean. Um, it was about Thea Wolf. Um, what was the name of it? The Woman in White, I think. Uh, very interesting book. Actually, this um, Jewish woman who came to Egypt to work as a nurse from Germany, she rescued quite a few Jews and um, treated ill Jews and made sure they made their way either to Palestine or to uh, the Far East. A very interesting book, The Woman in White by Ada Aharoni, if I remember rightly. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, did many of the Jews from the Middle East go to Rhodesia? Well, there was quite a contingent from uh, Turkey and Rhodes. Um, the, the, um, I'm not sure who else. Yes, Egyptians did, Egyptian Jews. Thank you, Linda, for your compliment. There was a banking family in Iraq called Zilka, Valerie. You're absolutely right. Uh, they were very, I didn't have time to go into what, uh, what, what the Iraqi Jews did, in, uh, but of course they were a very uh, prominent banking family, Zilka. In fact, my husband's got a, an envelope um, addressed to Bank Zilka, Baghdad, it, did need, it needed no address apart from that. Everyone knew <laughs> Zilka Bank. <laughs> uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, Betty Lowenstein says, Audrey Azulai's father. His name is Andre, actually, not Albert. He is not the finance minister of Morocco. He is the royal advisor. Uh, the Jewish advisor to the King of Morocco. And uh, you happen to be in the same hotel in Casablanca and the staff were bowing and scraping before him and well they might. Uh, Hannah, in your last lecture, you said Tunisia didn't get fresh, yeah, French citizenship like the Algerians and were given it if they held high office. My grandfather was naturalized French in uh, 1875. Do you know why? would he become French if he didn't hold a high office in government? Well, I don't think you had to have high office in government because there weren't that many Jews who did, uh, but I think about 25,000 out of a population of about 100,000 had French nationality. You could, there was a law passed, I think in the early 20th century that said you could actually become French, but there were various conditions to that. Thank you, Lorna, um, very kind of you to say. Um, 
Linda, there's a Kaduri family in Toronto. I'm not surprised. She worked with a teacher who changed his name to Kaduri to honor his father-in-law. They're not all connected to the Kaduris of Shanghai, I have to say. Kaduri is quite a common name. There was a prominent political scientist called Eli Kaduri, um, who actually was also a product of the Alios. Um, and he, he taught at the LSE, wrote lots of books. Uh, and as far as I know, he was not related to the Kaduris of Shanghai. Ruth, thank you for your compliment. Thank you. Uh, Mimi. Thank you for an interesting presentation. And sorry, I need to leave now. You're forgiven. I'm sorry about my interruption in the middle. Uh, Miriam Melame, thank you. Uh, Shapiro, listening, love listening to you. Thank you. And uh, Rhonda, also another compliment. Thank you. Excellent talks, wonderful mix of material. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Um, Oh, Veronica stayed in the Sassoon family house in Pune, near Bombay, you lucky thing, you. Um, and Hindi Hurt asks, how and when did Iraqi Jews go to India? I think that's the subject of another lecture, but very briefly, uh, basically there was a, a rather oppressive um, governor in Baghdad in the 1830s who, uh, called Daoud Pasha, and he persecuted uh, Jews like David Sassoon. And that's why uh, the Sassoons decided to leave Baghdad and they uh, began and, and they migrated to India. And that was really the start of, um, of their business um, and empire, which they set up first in Calcutta, then in Bombay, and then Indonesia, Burma. Uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai. Moroccan women still do a henna before the modern wedding, dressed in kaftans and the bride in a dress called berberiska, uh, made in elaborate velvet and gold and a very beautiful headdress. Yes, I will mention that in my next lecture, which is going to be about the Jews of Morocco. Uh, can you show us your book? Amazon has many books uprooted. Well, there's only one written by me. Uh, Lynn Julius, so hopefully you'll be able to find that, uh, Elena, and um, thank you, Yolande. Yes, you should be able to find it quite easily. Uh, David, loved your lecture. I am Linda Haim Meadows, the daughter of Nauma and Salim Haim, ah, relatives. <laughs> Saw you in London with your parents many years ago. Lovely to uh, be reunited here. Merci, madame, votre lecture, c'était super. Merci, Christopher Boul, for the compliment. A fascinating book is My Father's Paradise about an Iraqi family. Yes, I think somebody mentioned this last time. Um, and I did say that it wasn't all rosy in that book because the uh, main protagonist, his... Um, his sister was actually abducted as a child. This was not uncommon in the Kurdish lands where the Jews were actually little more than chattels. So I think it was a slightly idealized picture of life in Kurdistan. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Carol. Um, Bernie says the Salams, a family emigrated to the USA and the Salama brothers became the top periodontists in the US. Uh, <laughs> lovely to know that. Okay, yes, a lot of, uh, a lot of Sephardi Jews have done very well. And actually um, you could say that their uprooting was a blessing in disguise. Sarah Kemp, oh, nice to see you again. Thanks for that very positive presentation of all the achievements and our contributions to the whole world. Um, and GL says, is Paula Abdul not an Iraqi Jew? No, I think she's a Syrian one, as Danny Wolfson says, from Aleppo. 
Barbara uh, says a few Jewish Egyptian families came to South Africa with whom she was friendly. Sonia, thank you, thank you. And Valerie Cooper worked for Selim Zilka in London. Now, Selim Zilka was the founder of Mother Care, for, I believe. Uh, Yolande, have you heard of Edmund Jabez in Cairo, a poet? Egypt, uh, from Egypt who emigrated to Paris in 1958. Yes, I have heard of Edmond Jabez. There were so many prominent um, writers that couldn't mention them all. Uh, Yvonne S, thank you. Excellent and fascinating lecture. Very kind of you to say so. Sonia, where can I access your last lecture as I was unable to listen? Um, well, uh, Judy, could I send her a link, or perhaps you can? Um, and <laughs> we know. Uh, yeah, and and then sorry, yeah, uh, um, sorry, it goes on. Thank you. Yes, and then, then yes. we are going to have. Yes. Our, when our, learn when our light is up. Then, then. The... Say again. Sorry, Wendy. Sorry, Wendy. We have a very bad reception. Um, so what Wendy is saying is that we are currently working on our website, yes. and as soon as it's up and running, lectures, past Let's lectures will be able to a, probably. Yes. Sorry, we are crossing. We are crossing over. So uh, all our past lectures will be available as soon as our website is up and running, which should be hopefully when be I in September. Okay. With you. Okay, sorry, I just, just want to say hello to Jeanne Katz, who I met on, oh, a, October, on, on a plane, on a plane to Israel once, so nice to see you here, and thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Shall I just carry on quickly, scrolling down, or have we come to, shall I, yeah, shall I carry on? Pearl says, we've had conferences in Montreal about Jews from Arab lands. Yes, of course, Montreal is a great center of uh, the Sephardi community. Um, there's the Spanish synagogue in Montreal um, to which my relatives belong. And there are lots of Sephardic Jews from Morocco, as you say. And Betty says, Grace Mashal's grandfather was the chief rabbi of Baghdad and the family emigrated to India and eventually to England and Canada. Yes, actually, uh, David Mashal was the chief minister of Singapore, would you believe? And um, Shela Safra, Last Kings of Shanghai, yes, a very interesting book about the last king, about the uh, Sassoons and the Kaduris, I believe. Thank you, Shela. Uh, and brava, thank you, Martin. And one of the lectures you hosted was about the Jews of Tunis. Is it possible to put, put me in touch with the presenter of that lecture? I believe we may be, my grandmother was a Nahum. Now that was about the Jews of Libya. Um, wearing my other hat, which is running uh, Kharif, which is the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. We had a fascinating lecture about the, um, the Nahum family from Tripoli. And you can see the video on the Kharif website, which is uh, kharif.org. Just go to videos and you'll find the Kharif um, YouTube channel there. Um, and we have over 50 uh, videos of, of our events there. So sorry about the, um, uh, the advertisement. <laughs> so Yona asks, to what extent did the successful Jews get involved in teaching their skills to the Muslim populations? Um, that's very interesting. There were Muslims who actually attended the Alliance schools. Um, I think you need to, um, I mean, it was a massive job. You couldn't, Jews couldn't, couldn't, dare, couldn't even begin to teach their skills to the Muslim populations. And they weren't actually in charge of, uh, of, of the place. They didn't run the country. So there was a limit to what uh, they could do. And you have to bear in mind that the great mass of Jews were actually not in a very good state when the Alliance was set up. I mean, that there were terrible diseases. 
uh, the, you know, the Alliance had to uh, actually look after the health and welfare of, of these Jewish children before it even started to teach them, you know, so it had to teach them to wash their hands and to, you know, elementary hygiene. So, you know, I think they had their work cut out just looking after the Jewish community, never mind uh, the Muslim population. Jews of the Arab world are so much more colorful than the Jews of Eastern Europe. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> What's the current status of Jews in Morocco? Listen to my next lecture and I will tell you. David Mashal, Betty says, was Grace's cousin. Oh, interesting. I, I think we may be related as well somewhere down the line. Do you know the story of Judy Feld Carr, a Toronto Jew? Yes, uh, we actually invited her to do a Harif event. And you can see the video on our website. Um, she was an amazing woman, uh, an Ashkenazi Jew who actually uh, raised funds to ransom desperate uh, Syrian Jews who wanted to leave. Um, an amazing woman. And thank you, Romy, for your kind words. Is that the end? I think. It looks like that's the last um, comment, um, Lynn. Thank you so much. Yeah, and yeah. Lynn, to everybody, sorry about the few glitches we had along the way. Yes, um, I am sorry about that. That's okay, because <laughs> I lost you as well. And we seem to have lost Wendy because she's had a bad connection as well. So <laughs> thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And remember, there are no talks tomorrow. So we'll see everybody again on Saturday. So take care. Be well, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lynn. Bye. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.